All right, and with that, I'd like to welcome everyone to our little debate panel or discussion panel where hopefully we will have a friendly conversation with one another. And I noticed some, pe some people have joined me up on the stage here, but who are these people? I have no idea. Can you maybe quickly introduce yourself? Sure. Uh, my name is Brian Turleson. I work at Microsoft on uh, the language side of the Chakra Core engine and also on TypeScript. Um, I also go to the TC39 meetings and uh, do that standards work as well. I think it's a little bit of an understatement to say you do a little bit of standards work. You're the editor of the ECMAScript spec. <laughs> True. I mean, can I get an applause for that? Yeah. OK, and who are you? Yeah, my name is Benedict. I already spoke earlier yesterday. You might have seen my talk. I work on the V8 engine, uh, which is the engine in Chrome. And yeah, I do a bit of performance work sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> Another understatement, I guess. Uh, wait, that's, that's an interesting coincidence. You both work on a JavaScript engine? Wow. Oh, surprise. Yeah. Wow. Maybe we should talk about that. Yeah, it's OK. But you mentioned that you work on TypeScript. That's one of the things you do. Um, and we see a lot of developers using things like TypeScript and Flow and our developer tools in their, in their workflows. Um, and you also work on standards. Do you think types is something that should somehow be added to ECMAScript as a language itself? Or should it remain at the build level? Um, my personal opinion, I think, is that uh, in, um, in, as far as types being in the in the engine and understood by the engine and used to produce um, optimal machine code in sort of the same way that a, a, a C compiler might. Um, I, I'm not convinced that that is really possible. JavaScript seems sort of fundamentally uh, opposed to um, that kind of work. Um, I think probably Benedict can share some actual data on that um, based on um, strong mode investigations. Uh, but I think there is some uh, a space for types in the, in the tooling space, um, a sort of erasable type layer like like TypeScript has, where um, there can be uh, you can uh, you know maybe even see them in the dev tools and get feedback in your dev tools in the browser about uh, what ha what's happening with types, uh, and you know get errors at runtime for for type mismatches and that kind of stuff. Uh, I think that's an interesting avenue to pursue. Uh, but it is also very difficult to do because uh, we have a lot of type systems now. We have uh, TypeScript, we have Flow, there's also Clojure Compiler. Um, and these are all kind of occupying the same space and they all have different ways of doing things. So I think we'll see over the next few years whether there's, co there's a kind of coalescing of these ideas and sort of rallying around one sort of system to, to rule them all or if, uh, as, I, as I actually suspect, uh, there's actually value in having type systems that make different trade-offs. Um, uh, so I, th I think that might be actually an interesting place we might end up. Yeah, I agree with m many things you said. So I, I don't really see types as a way to uh, speed up JavaScript performance because you cannot really rely on them and the types are, don't operate on the level that the engine needs to operate on. Um, what I see though is the value for developers. And I think the missing link that we have so far is that the browser doesn't give you, or the engine doesn't give you feedback on whether you actually, um, uh, it doesn't validate the types really. So you validate ahead of time, but then at runtime anything can happen anyways. You can pass objects that don't have that type because those are just living outside of the TypeScript world. And um, we recently launched um, um, a new system that we call uh, type profiling, which you already might have seen already. Um, actually, Apple has this for some time in the web inspector. And one use case that we could imagine is um, we collect the types at runtime, so we know precisely what kind of object we have seen. And we could use this information and combine it with the static uh, information that you have in TypeScript or in Flow and signal errors if you see a type, a, a, an object of, at runtime that doesn't match the type of the TypeScript declaration, for example. And doing this, I think you can produce pretty good code because uh, the engine, you keep your code monomorphic just because you um, use the types to restrict it. You can get, uh, if you subset JavaScript, like if you get rid of eval and you get rid of the function constructor and a few other things, um, you end up with the sort of JavaScript subset that could be strongly typed. Um, but that doesn't 
I don't know that many people are interested in using something that's not really JavaScript and you can't like use JavaScript libraries. Right. Uh, you briefly touched on strong mode before. Is that something you have some more background on? I don't have a lot of background on strong mode, except that this experiment was discontinued because um, we found that, so the idea is that we, um, we have a subset of, uh, sort of sub subset of, v uh, of JavaScript uh, running in a dedicated mode, similar to strict mode, there would be a, a use strong. And it would be restricted so that many of the things that make your program slow or uh, behave in the wrong way uh, no longer happen. Um, but I think that goes against what the standards committee is currently interested in, in having this one JS approach. We also had an experiment on Tracker Core. We had an awesome intern who um, wanted to investigate uh, how good, how, what, what kind of performance gains we could get if we built in types into JavaScript. And these types weren't TypeScript types, these types were actual native types. Um, you know, so he was annotating variables as this is an in 32 and this is, you know, uh, an in 16 and that kind of stuff. And uh, we found that as long as you just blindly trust the types, which is not something that you can actually get away with in, in practice, but if you blindly trust the types, you can get some pretty nice speed ups across the board on the order of like 10 to 15%. Um, but the, the real trouble is we, we have this awesome ecosystem with so much stuff in it and we just can't, we can't break that. We need to find a way to evolve from where we are and it's not entirely clear what that looks like yet. And speaking of standardization, at TC39 there is a stage process for new features to be added to the language. Uh, would you say there is a similar process that happens once a feature starts getting implemented in the engine itself? A similar process? Like what kind of stages does a, a feature go through once it starts to get implemented on the browser side, so outside oh. of the TC39 process? Um, yeah, I mean, at least uh, on our team, we uh, usually start with some kind of prototype or a, a, a spike. So we'll start doing this work, um, you know, uh, around stage three in the in the standards process. Um, that's that's a stage when uh, the committee says we're pretty much done making changes to this, and we really want implementer feedback. Um, and then it's just a, uh, a matter of uh, getting all the test 262 pass, uh, test passing after that. <laughs> no small feat. Um, uh, and then after that, it's a, an iterative uh, cycle of you know, shipping these features to developers and developers tell us, hey, this is great, but you know, X, Y, Z, we go fix that, ship it again, and this whole cycle just kind of uh, continues. So those wouldn't be bug fixes anymore because you already passed the test suite? Would they be more like performance optimizations for common Yeah, patterns? yeah, it's Things usually like performance that. optimizations. Um, it's really hard to anticipate in advance what patterns you guys are, are gonna be using. Like, um, it's, 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 uh, it's a hard game to play, and uh, if we try to guess uh, what you might use, uh, we might get it wrong. We might spend a lot of time optimizing something that just isn't important. Uh, so this feedback cycle is really important to us so that we can you know, hear from developers how they're using a feature so that we can optimize it and improve ergonomics and other things like tooling and, and that kind of stuff. What are your thoughts on that, Benedict? It's actually very similar. So we also start looking to new features once, once they reach end of stage two, early stage three. Uh, we usually try, nowadays we try to work together with Babel, for example, to also make sure that uh, things are aligned because it would be really bad if you use the feature at stage one already and then you rely on Babel semantics and then the browser gives you completely different semantics uh, once it hits the engine. Um, on the performance side, we, we, we have to wait until uh, some use appears. So even uh, before it hits the browser, we can often see it um, when we just look at the actual code that people write and then transpile via Babel. Um, but it's hard to estimate what is important. So, for example, we just now start optimizing proxies. Just um, this year we started looking into proxy performance. And proxies have been there in year six since uh, two years already. So this is roughly the timeline um, when we notice that, okay, maybe it's time to look into how people use it and then optimize the relevant cases. So it's, it sounds like engines optimized for real world code, which means that there's a bit of a chicken egg problem where if there's a new language feature that lands in browsers, um, a lot of developers, maybe they think, oh, it's not going to be fast yet in engine X or Y, so I'm going to 
not use it for now and maybe still transpile my code and avoid using this feature directly, but that means that also it won't get optimized. So how, what is the best way to break this pattern and break this cycle? Uh, so in my experience, uh, since we have evergreen browsers nowadays, uh, you should go for it as early as possible. Uh, maybe just ship it to a subset of the users and see, can you do this? Is this viable? Is this uh, a no-go? And specifically on the Node side, you uh, completely control the version of Node and you completely know exactly which version of Chakra Core or which version of V8 is inside. So uh, it would be nice if you try it earlier and provide feedback, and then we can look into this. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Um, and also, I find that um, a lot of times you can get away with using these new features in areas of your application that aren't performance critical. Um, so that's, that's sort of my, my approach to this problem is to, um, uh, cause I, like, I can't wait to use these features after they get implemented, but uh, you know, I'm not gonna be using four of in a, in a hot path because it's, um, well, now it's pretty fast, but it wasn't as of six months ago. Um, uh, so yeah, I think um, there is a little bit of a chicken and an egg problem, but uh, yeah, just uh, you know, we really rely on feedback, and you really can't get out of uh, out of that uh, out of that problem. Um, benchmarks are interesting, um, especially when they go out of their way to try and uh, emulate real-world code as as much as possible. But benchmarks just aren't. Um, aren't enough, like we really need to hear from uh, developers. And, and on top of that, I see a danger. Uh, one pattern that I see in the wild is um, when people use Babel and try to optimize um, the transformation so that it produces the ideal whatever transpiled code. And um, I think there's some danger in doing that because long term you don't want to transpile this code anymore, or ideally you shouldn't transpile it anymore. So uh, I see the value in that, but there's also a lot of danger because then um, once you stop transpiling, you will be sad, and then you go back to transpiling, and you don't make progress. Right, so the set of features to be transpiled should be a moving window. And I think an easy way for developers to make that happen is to use Bobble preset env, which basically it's like auto prefixer for Bobble. So you tell it the browsers that you explicitly support, and it won't transpile anything that it doesn't need to transpile. And that kind of solves the chicken egg problem as well, to some extent, right? Uh, to some extent. Um, you know, the, it's the, the performance of the transpiled code um, isn't particularly relevant to the, the performance of the feature that you're trying to use. Um, but it, it, you know, if you're using something like preset env, it does mean that um, you know, once browsers catch up, you're going to sort of immediately be um, opted into this uh, new feature, um, which is certainly helpful. Yeah, and on top of that, there are many options um, to even ship modern code already to modern browsers. So one option that we have been discussing a lot in the past, um, you can just ship modules to the browser nowadays, and there's a fallback. You can just provide the full transpired bundle to browsers who don't support modules, but all the browsers that support modules support ES6, so that is a good way to upgrade without breaking uh, old browsers. So we should be transpiling to two sets of two bundles, basically. Essentially, it produces two bundles. So there's a Webpack sample configuration for this, or there are probably uh, also roll-up configurations to do that. And I think this is a pretty safe way to move forward. And it buys you a lot, because the untranspired code is usually, it, it's up to orders of magnitude smaller uh, than the transpiled code. OK, so that's something that we all can do to make, I mean, to give better feedback and more data to browser developers so yes. that they can make all these new features as fast as possible. That'd be great. Cool. <laughs> and we have, I want to stress this again, we have evergreen browsers. Report a bug. We can look into it. If we don't know that there's a problem, then we can never fix it unless we stumble over it by accident. And then six weeks later, up to 12 weeks later, you have the new version. And the feature is optimized, ideally. That sounds pretty cool. I'm sold. <laughs> now, uh, we're here at a conference with lots of JavaScript developers, and we've talked about standardization a little bit earlier. Um, how can the JavaScript community directly contribute to the whole standardization process? Um, there's a, a, a number of ways. In fact, I'm giving a talk um, at, uh, I believe, 4.30 today um, on that topic, essentially. Uh, but the Spoiler alert. Yeah, spoiler alert. Uh, you should still attend my talk even after I say some things. <laughs> um, so the, 
the, the best way is, of course, to, to just try these features as they come out and give us feedback. But even earlier in the process, um, TC39 is now entirely on GitHub. All of the standards work that we do plays out on GitHub. Very little of it happens behind um, closed doors. It's usually just like administrivia and um, you know, IP related discussions and stuff like that. Uh, so github.com slash tc39 has, I think there's like 100 repos now. Um, like every proposal has its own GitHub repo that you can follow. So if you're really interested in a particular proposal like pipeline or the bind operator or whatever, you can go to GitHub and find that repo and you can watch it and the issues are used to discuss, um, you know, issues. And pull requests, uh, you can send actually pull requests and that's fine, we can take those. Um, so that might update the, you can spend your own, spec, uh, make your own uh, spec updates. Uh, that's a really great way. Um, also, like, we're all on Twitter. You can talk to us on Twitter. Uh, we have an IRC channel on Freenode. I know IRC is not the easiest uh, uh, technology to use, um, but uh, uh, we, we do have that as well. So that, uh, that's another way. I remember times when things were different, when the ECMAScript spec was published as like a Word document. It was literally maintained as a Word document with yep. annotations for the diffs. Yep. So for each new release, you would have to download it with annotations enabled, go through the annotations, figure out what changed, and then even for small typos, people would have to report a bug and create a tracking issue. It and then the poor fixed. editor would have to go and fix it in the Word doc and upload it to somewhere. And now uh, most of my job is just accepting pull requests from uh, various people, um, so it's pretty nice. That sounds pretty good. I, I remember at the time people actually ended up writing a script to turn the Word document or even the PDF version generated from the Word document into an HTML version so that it could be posted online yep. and linked to, yeah. And that, that actually turned out to be uh, transformational work because it was that work that enabled us to actually move the spec onto GitHub because we're not just dumping the Word doc in a GitHub repo, right? We, we have a whole new uh, HTML spec format and the whole tool chain built on Node um, to make it like really easy for web developers especially to uh, write spec text and read spec text and uh, contribute. Right. Um, what other challenges would you say there are when it comes to um, measuring the real world performance? Because you mentioned before that there's a lot of micro benchmarks out there, synthetic benchmarks, and they're useful, certainly. But what we really want to optimize for is the real-world performance of the code that people end up writing, right? Yeah, this is a very complicated topic. So for, for one thing, there's the web. Um, we can just browse around and check web pages, and we do this. We actually take a web page replay to make it reproducible, and we look into web pages, what they do, like top 1,000 web pages. Um, but we have a lot of trouble on the node side because we don't have access to your applications and you should better not give everyone access to it. <laughs> um, so getting useful workloads there is very hard. Plus the workloads on the web are just one aspect of the problem. It's not, uh, it, if you load a web page on your mobile phone, then the engine does something completely different than, you, than if you, I don't know, uh, use Google Maps or uh, use Google Earth on your uh, desktop. And the same for Node. And there's also uh, the developer tooling side. So we uh, last week or the week before, we launched a new benchmark suite that is the web tooling benchmark. And we really literally just drop the code that is shipped on NPM into the benchmark and run exactly the code that runs on your machine too, so that we make sure we don't just have a proxy for the application, but we measure the application itself. So the goal is to make the build times of developers' tools faster? Like yes, when you run yes. npm run builds, you're speeding that up? Yes. So much. tools like Webpack or parts of Webpack are included. Um, Babel is in, TypeScript is in, Uglify is in, all of the things that take up all the time on your machine. And then when you deploy it to somewhere on the continuation, uh, continuous integration service, for example. Right. Benchmarks like these can be used by all browser and engine developers, right? It's not just uh, specific to one engine. Yep, yep. We've been looking at uh, the web tooling benchmark as well. I, I certainly appreciate that benchmark since npm build is or npm run build is. Um, well, that's my get coffee time, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Um, hmm. <laughs> Does anyone have a question from the audience? Please you raise ask, your hands. A, ask us a question. Come on, asking us a question would be less awkward than not asking a question at this point. So we're gonna, we're just going to be quiet up here and stare out. WebAssembly, <laughs> never heard of it. Have you guys? Uh, I, what is this technology? I don't know. <laughs> I love WebAssembly. Um, so like, I work on JavaScript, the, the language side, and, and I'm kind of a language geek, I guess. Um, so like, while I appreciate a bunch of the interesting things with WebAssembly you know, regarding um, you know, compiling native applications to run on the web and, and um, you know, getting really close to native performance and all of that, really I'm just excited about the prospect of uh, other languages becoming first class citizens on the web. I think that's going to open up a huge um, uh, window for innovation from um, all of you in the audience. Um, and I'm, I'm really excited to see um, uh, what that technology enables. Yeah, I, I agree. I, personally, I would love to see like next year or 2019 having one big game publisher publish on the web. Like next version of Assassin's Creed runs on the web only. That would be, be awesome. awesome. Wow. Yeah. How many megabytes would it take, though? Yeah, that's an unsolved problem, plus all right. the DRM issues that they have. Right. But yeah, so there are some technical details, but right, otherwise it, it would just be awesome. On the other hand, for a game, it's different than for downloading a website where you want to view some content, right? So you, you might be willing to, to pay a little bit more and get all those megabytes in. So I would be fine if it wouldn't run on my phone. Right, So that exactly. would be okay. The use case is completely yeah, different. Yeah, it's right? desktop. I think there's also a lot of room for um, uh, like you know, these 3D engines have these massive asset pipelines, and um, I think there's it's we're we're in the very early days. I think we're going to see tooling that's going to enable sort of streaming of game content and and that kind of stuff too to help um, help address this problem of like, hey, if you want to play a game, you probably don't want to download it, you know all of those assets again. Like even just checking if it's fresh could be could be expensive. Right. That makes sense. There was a question. Oh yeah, sure. Okay, so the question is about the binary AST proposal, just so everyone hears. Okay. Okay, so what is the status of the binary AST proposal at TC39, and what is your stance on it for both of you? So I don't know, um, you can probably talk to the state, but my personal opinion on it, I think it would solve some really hard problems that we currently face in the JavaScript land. But um, for every new thing that we add, it also adds a lot of new problems that we then have to solve as well. So uh, while I, I'm generally in favor of it, um, I'm not the expert there, so I, I leave it to the expert to decide. And yeah, maybe yeah. Brian has a better opinion uh, on I'm, this. I'm also not uh, an expert on, on this. Um, uh, so the, the basic idea of this proposal is um, what if we, instead of shipping JavaScript source code to browsers, what if we shipped some packaged binary that includes that source text, but also additional information that is sort of uh, shoved up front so that engines don't need to uh, scan over all of your code and collect all of this information about like what variables have you captured and um, you know are you using eval in this scope and all of this uh, sort of information that our runtimes need to uh, produce optimal code. Um, it's a great idea. Like the, there are, I, I definitely agree that this is a, an actual problem. Like this addresses like the goal of this proposal is to address that parse time bottleneck that. Many of you with massive code bases are feeling, you know, it can take seconds to parse JavaScript on mobile devices uh, on some big properties. So, like, that is um, not a good situation. Um, but in terms of, of uh, difficulties, uh, what, I, what I'm really interested to see is how this proposal will handle um, all of the different kinds of information that engines need to collect, because we all actually collect slightly different information. 
because um, we, we just have different implementations and different trade-offs. Uh, so I think this proposal will only work if it is a sort of superset of all of the information that all of the implementations need to collect in order to produce optimal code. Um, I'm not super convinced that that's possible, but I, th uh, I think Mozilla is going to work on a prototype. And once that prototype um, uh, comes out, I think we'll know a lot more about um, how feasible this idea is. And what's the current status of the proposal? Is it at stage zero or one? Um, it's probably stage one. I don't, I don't remember offhand. It's, it's really easy to get to stage one. Stage one is, yeah, we agree there's some problem here. And there's definitely some problem there. So let me, let me say one thing. There will be a um, session in the deep track by my colleague Maya uh, on the parser. So that would be an ideal question for that session. Oh, yes. OK. And with that, I would like to thank you for your cooperation during this uh, debate. <laughs> oh, such a debate, yes. Such a debate, yeah. Such a debate. <laughs> it sounds like you agree about a lot of things. Yeah.